Good evening. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. We sure appreciate the presence of everyone and thank you for every effort you've made to be here. Uh, I want to tell you a couple of things. One, the title of our message tonight is Truth Matters, but, but I will say this, I was kind of waffling between what, what the topic would be. And I think I'm going I'm to still tell you what the other idea was, because I think it's pretty significant too. Truth matters. They don't matter. I think it's a good idea for us to understand they don't matter. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14 that we will all stand before the Lord and give account for ourselves. We're going to answer. And the truth is, uh, we take responsibility for our own actions and our own choices and our own decisions. It is in our hands and it is in our control. And despite what others might be doing around us, we still have the capacity to choose to be obedient to God or not. Now, the next thing I wanted to say is I am very thankful. I'm very thankful that at some point in history, a group of people got together and, and went through, the, uh, went through the, the Bible and put numbers with it. I'm glad somebody made the effort to set up what we call chapters and what we call verses. I'm thankful for that. Can you imagine what it'd be like for us if somebody just said, go to the book of Leviticus and good luck finding where we are. I'm thankful for the numbers. But it wasn't necessarily written that way. In fact, the book of Galatians that I wanted to reference you to right now is a letter. <coughs> And it was a letter that through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a, a good man, a good man with history, wrote a letter. And I, I find very interesting what he wrote in what we call Galatians chapter 6. And it's significant that it's Galatians chapter 6 because... That represents toward the very end of the letter. It is really that section of, of the letter that, that really brings his letter to its conclusion, kind of its climactic point. What do I really want to say that people will remember, that they'll pick up on, that will stick with them, and you find it, in Galatians chapter 6. But I'll also tell you, Galatians 6 is kind of a weird section of Scripture. In fact, on the surface, when you look at it, it's kind of tough to put it all together until you, maybe when you take a step back, and you take a, a big view glance of it, you can kind of understand the language. But I'd like to read to you from this section of Scripture, and we'll let that kind of introduce us into our study tonight. I'm going to pick up in Galatians chapter 6, and then we're going to go down, and we're going to start in verse 2. And then we're going to read a little bit uh, through verse 5. And I'm not going to read every word of this, but I, 
But I wanted to look at a section of, of this scripture starting in verse 2. And I wanted to point out that basically, if a man's talking and he's reading this section of scripture, basically it's a, it's a singular thought. I mean, if, if you're having a conversation with someone and you are saying these words, you're already thinking about the next set of words you're going to say. It's almost in a breath. It's in a thought. And listen to what he wrote here. In verse 2, it says, uh, for us to consider, bear one another's burdens. What a beautiful thought. Bear one another's burdens. Lift, boost other people. But here's where it kind of gets unusual. What you might call on some level a bit weird. And that is, verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. Well, basically in the same thought process... Verse 5 says, each one will have to bear his own load. Now, how do you put those two thoughts together? In fact, it seems like they are totally opposite statements. One of them says, bear one another's burdens. Be conscious of supporting and helping other people. But then it goes on to say, each one will carry his own load. That I bear that mantle of responsibility myself for those things I do and for the actions I take. And here's how I've, I figure you put this language in Galatians 6 together and it's based on this idea. Every one of us reads this scripture personally. I read this scripture for what it means to me. I'm the recipient. And so through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word comes to me, Clark, be conscious of your fellow man. You lift them up and give them support and help them to bear their burdens. You be there for them. But it also says, now Clark, you be careful because at the end of the day, you're responsible to carry your own load. And what the Bible talks about here in Galatians 6 is what I call controllable elements. Have you ever thought about how much worry and stress we endure as people based on things we cannot control? I've lived with my sweet bride for over 34 years and I have not figured her out yet. You know, no, 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 it don't look like I'm going to. And, and that's the closest person on this earth to me. So, so the reality is, I, I control my own actions. I control what I do. But, but I don't have, I can't control the actions of my children. I, I, I do the very best I can to influence and encourage and teach. But they're independent human beings. But Clark, I'm controllable. And therefore, it's in my hands to look to you and do everything I can to build you up and support you. And I'd sure appreciate your help and encouragement. But I'm not going to let your lack of support and your lack of encouragement keep me from doing and living as God intends me to live. I'm going to answer for my own actions, and so will you. Controllable elements. 
they really don't matter. You, you act for yourself. You control what you do. People can let you down or disappoint or not come through or come through abundantly. You just, we just don't always know. But we need to understand what our responsibility is to carry that load and live the concept that the truth that is God's Word matters and that needs to be our guide and where we base our decisions. I believe 2 Samuel 23 is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. And it's going to share with us some very important uh, information for us to apply. In 2 Samuel 23, you'll be reading about what is called David's Mighty Men. And you're going to see a list of names that are given that are descriptive of some of the conduct of these dedicated soldiers in the army that's being led by David, the man of God, after God's own heart. And I want to tell you about two of them. The first one we're going to look at is found in verse 9. I want you to listen to his story. Next to him among these mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, you figure anybody this dad's name is Dodo is going to be tough, so I'm not surprised. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. Eleazar rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the men returned after him only to strip the slain. Eleazar is ready for battle. And when the Philistines posed the threat, Eleazar stepped up, ready to engage in the battle, as a man of God, as a man of the Israelite army, as a servant of David, the man after God's own heart, he was ready to go. But you have to think, don't you? Don't you have to think Eleazar was probably assuming all those people that were raised just like him? and heard the same lessons just like him, and knew the same story of the hero David was back when he encountered a man named Goliath, and knew the history of the children of Israel, and how God had loved and protected His people, and how He had stood by their side. Don't you know Eleazar was probably assuming all of these friend brothers we're going to be right there with him. But instead, he steps out ready to fight. And all his brothers run away. To the extent that Eleazar is now by himself facing this enormous enemy that's posing a threat to God's people. It would have been so easy for Eleazar to just follow the crowd and run away and get out of there like everybody else was doing. But not Eleazar. He was not controlled by the actions or lack of action of other people even people who his expectation would have been pretty high. And so Eleazar stood there and fought. 
And this is how he fought. He struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. You could not separate his hand from the sword. His grip was so tight. One man fighting the enemy by himself. And I don't know what the reality of your days are like. But the truth is, you can pretty much count on the fact there's going to be moments where we're called on to be strong enough to stand up ourselves. I appreciate when I'm linked together with my brethren, but sometimes it's just me like it was Eleazar who stepped up, engaged. And it's interesting, by the way, that the language of the text says that the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And then the aspect is almost humorous. It says after Eleazar withstood the enemy, fought against the enemy till the sword clung to his hand, all those boys that had run away, now they come back to collect the plunder. You know? Now they come back to get, the, to get what's left over. They showed up when the battle was already fought. But Eleazar was right there in the trenches. He was willing to fight even if he fought by himself. We, the Bible's going to go on to tell us about another man Next to him was Shammah, the son of A.G., the Hararite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, struck down the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. He took his stand in the midst of the ground and he took his stand by himself. When all those people that were raised just like him and were taught just like him ran away, Shammah was left to make a decision. Do I engage do I participate in the fight or do I run away like everybody else? He refused to let the actions or lack thereof of others control what he did. And on both of these occasions, with both of these warriors, Eleazar and Shammah, the common denominator is on both of those occasions, God brought about a great victory. A great victory that would have never happened had it not been for the willingness of one man to stand up and fight. To not be like the crowd. To not follow along with everybody else. To not let the majority rule and set the guide and establish the standard. These men are heroes. I don't know that we've paid enough attention to them through the years because the truth is they are models of what we should be. These guys had gone through some adversity but they had risen to a point of significance. We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. And the Bible talks about their role of service and the position that they took in the kingdom and the respect that they garnered based on their conduct. And it also tells us about a king who was a tad bit of an egomaniac. And he built this golden image. 
And it was his desire that at proper moments of time that the whole kingdom would stop and bow down to his golden image. And it was a law. It was authorized. It would not be changed. And for anyone that refused to bow down to this image, they faced a destiny. And that destiny was to spend time in a fiery furnace. There's nothing appealing, by the way, about a fiery furnace. I don't like to get my finger pricked at the doctor's office, much less go through a fiery furnace. But these people were told, if you don't bow down to the king's image, that's your destiny. And it's all set up and the music begins to play. And it seems like a whole kingdom bows down to the king's image. But after a while, there's going to come a report to the king and he's going to tell, he's going to be told about the actions of three men. Three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to the king's image. When everybody else did, when they were highly threatened, if they chose to not bow, three men, chose to refuse to bow to the king's golden image. Well, the king lost himself. He went into an absolute rage. He brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, and he, he sort of tried to give them a way out and gave them the chance to bow and gave their, them the chance to submit I love the sentiment of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I, I love the way they expressed, our God's going to take care of us. But I'll but I, but I, but I remind you, I feel pretty strongly about this. I know God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I know God was with Daniel when he faced the lion's den. And I know God was with David when he faced Goliath. But I also believe that same God was with Stephen when he preached the gospel to a mass of people. And they stoned him to death. We can absolutely be sure God's going to protect us. and He's going to take care of us. But we don't always know how that's going to look. We don't know what the ramifications for for our choices and decisions will be like on this earth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose to refuse to bow to that image. And they said that our God is going to take care of us, but even if our lives are not spared, even if we face the reality of the fiery furnace, we are not going to bow to your image, O King. Even if we face the fiery furnace and the uncertainty of what that was going to mean, they refused to bow. Now, there's something I've, I've thought about I'd like to share with you. Have you ever thought about how hard it would be for men in that situation to conduct themselves in such a way that it was obvious they were not bowing. Can you imagine how easy it would have been to just give the illusion? You know, bend over and tie your shoe. Pick up a piece of gum. Anything that would give some kind of physical action that might give the impression that you're bowing while still maybe being able to sleep at night? Do you think? I remember a number of years ago, my first cousin got married in Nashville. And, and, and I remember going to, to, to his wedding, and, uh, and it was in a large cathedral kind of building there in Nashville. And, and, and I remember 
when the men come out on the stage, the, the, the preachers that were involved and, and, the, and the groom and the, and the best man, man they, they came out onto the stage for the wedding. And, and, and the first guy that was in a ministerial position came out and he was wearing uh, a very ornamental kind of robe. You know, uh, it, I believe it was his home church building where they were. And he comes out and he's dressed in all this splendor. And then he walks over by, by this image that's placed up against the wall that you would pass by as the men were walking to the front of the stage. And I remember that man stopped, looked at that image, and bowed down to it. And then a friend of mine in ministry was that second guy. And I can still see him walk on that stage. I can still see him as his body approached the area where that image was, and I can still see the way he reacted to almost bow his back so that it would be obvious he was not bowing. He left no doubt, no compromise. No, why can't we just all get along? Clarity in refusing to bow to a graven image. And I absolutely believe that was the position that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took. They made it obvious so that they could be observed and nobody would question or doubt what their life commitment was. Far too many people who express an allegiance to God in the world that we live in today have indulged in way too much compromise of what God's Word tells us just for the sake of getting along in this world. We need warriors who are willing to step up and stand up and even stand alone based on your convictions of what God's Word means to us. By the way, if you can be so wishy-washy concerning your convictions, they're really not convictions at all. They refuse to bow. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> you know that they were not placed with kindness in that fiery furnace, but were thrust by soldiers into that fiery furnace with such an intense heat that even soldiers who were a part of the process lost their lives. But those men walked freely in that fiery furnace. They came out of there. The Bible says there was no smell of smoke on them. No singe, no burns. And they walked in that fiery furnace free. There's even talk in the text of a fourth figure who was in that fiery furnace with them. God indeed was with them. And we hold them in high respect today for their willingness to take a stand and put their trust in God regardless what the consequences on this earth might be. In Genesis 39, Joseph was placed in an incredible dilemma. Now, he had already gone through some really tough times. As a matter of fact, his own brothers had turned on him, sold him into slavery, and now Joseph finds himself a young man living in a life of bondage and service in the house of Potiphar. Well, while Joseph's working there, a Potiphar's wife takes her eyes and puts them on Joseph and takes the shine to him 
And she just simply says, lie with me. Now, you know what Joseph's actions were. The Bible says about him that he was pretty strong. And he started to preach. And he said to Potiphar's wife, how can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? It's amazing how strong he was when he, when he endured this incredible test that was thrust on him by Potiphar's wife. You see, this is one of those situations where you make your life easier on this earth by going along with the crowd, by doing what the appeal of the world is. He was facing potential conflict and adversity and maybe even the loss of his life if he resists her. If he goes into her, no trouble on this earth. That's the easy step. That's the easy part of the process. But Joseph said, I'm not going to commit this great wickedness. I'm not going to sin against God. I'm going to stick with my convictions as God has directed me. But she was persistent. She stayed at it, pestering him day by day with the same words. And I find it interesting that as the context goes on and the pestering remains and the words stay the same, lie with me, it's obvious it gets tougher on Joseph. Don't you think? So that by the time you get to the climax of this passage, we find Joseph's in the house by himself with just Potiphar's wife. And she thinks she's got him. And she calls out those same words, lie with me. And the Bible talks about a Joseph in that situation that does not have time to preach this time. He doesn't have time to bow his feet and take his stand and preach. Instead, the Bible says he began to run. He fled away from her. And she grabbed his clothes and had them in her hand. And he kept on running with the evidence in her hand. She could make any accusation against Joseph that she wanted to. And she had proof right there with her. And I've thought about this a good bit. Thought about it a lot. The Bible gives a description of Joseph and describes him as being handsome in form and appearance. It talks about him being well built. Now, I got to figure, based on the description we have in the Bible of Joseph, based on his physical description, I just, I have to believe if he'd have wanted to stand there and scrap with her to get his clothes, don't you think he could have got them? Don't you think he had the physical strength? He could have taken his clothes out of her hand and run away with the clothes adorning his body. But instead, he kept on running. What does that mean? Do you think it possibly means that the, that the push and stress of this moment was so affecting him that he knew he had to get away from there? He had to run away, and he had to run away right then. Our man Joseph made a choice. A choice that seemed like a lot of folks don't make. He willingly made a spiritual choice instead of an earthly one. His spiritual choice 
literally put his physical life on the line. You can talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can talk about their friend Daniel and his actions of prayer three times a day toward Jerusalem, just like he always did. You, you could talk about these people and you could talk about the stands that they willingly took, even when adversity was pushing all around them. And we learn from these characters the value of taking a spiritual stand even when there might be earthly consequences. Are you willing to choose spiritual over earthly? Are you willing to make the choice to do things as God directs you to do, even if it makes it tough on this earth? I, I know people uh, um, face levels of persecution for their faith. But the truth is, you know, I've lived every moment of my life in what could be described as the heart of the Bible Belt. That's my whole history. My guess is it's probably some of yours. You know, and, 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 you know, and compared to what Joseph endured and to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced, I, I sort of have a hard time relating to that. I don't know that I've ever really had what you call a fiery furnace experience. But I'm also reminded of the words of another good friend of mine when he made the statement, perhaps our greatest persecution is our lack of persecution. That what you're called on to stand up for when you're tested and when you're pushed that's going to reflect who you are. If somebody's threatening my life, you can be pretty sure I'm not going to be victimized by lukewarmness. I'm not going to stick around for something that doesn't mean that much to me. I'm going to be all in or all out. But there will be no fence I'd be straddling There'd be no gray area I'd be looking for. Some of the great moments in the history of God's people have transpired when they were pushed to the absolute limit. They don't really matter. God's Word matters. It is in our hands to take our stand. And nobody can control that for us but ourselves. Nobody can be faithful enough to force that upon us. Nobody can be materialistic or weak enough to force their mindset and actions upon us. I will stand before the Lord in judgment and give account for the way I've lived my life and the choices that I make. I think about Achan. And I think this evening about Achan and I think about Ananias in Acts 5. And I think about Adam, that first created man. I could have said Eve. But Adam starts with an A, so I thought he'd be the one I'd say. Ananias, Achan, Adam. Think about what their life experience was. Think about what they were around. Achan was a marcher. At one of the great moments in the history of God's people, as they marched around Jericho, Achan was there 
when the walls came tumbling down, Achan was present when the children of Israel won a great victory that day. Achan was present and heard the speech that was delivered by Joshua as a representative and messenger of God himself. Achan heard, Achan saw, Achan experienced, and Achan marched. And Achan took of the accursed thing which God had directed them not to touch, not to transport, not to take. He took it and he hid it in his tent. Now look, I know that this context is not going to close until you find Achan put to death. But I also think it's worth pointing out that not only was Achan put to death, but there was a lot of folks that suffered because of his refusal to take a stand for God. There were innocent soldiers who were in the battlefield when Joshua absolutely believed they'd cakewalk through that victory. God was going to be with them. The Bible talks about those that lost their lives in the battle with Ai. And it was all the result of the actions of Achan and what he supposedly just hid in his tent. How much of his family lost their lives because of the choice of Achan and the decision that he made to go against the direction of God when he was a part of one of the great moments in the history of God's people. Adam, paradise, a place of perfection where God is his closest neighbor, where God communicated directly with him, where he experienced the splendor and the beauty and the resources of that garden that God placed him in. And I don't know exactly how it all transpired. I know the Bible describes a pretty lengthy conversation between the enemy and Eve to which she ultimately took of the fruit. And then the Bible's description becomes very simple as it relates to Adam. And she gave it to him and he ate it. It's amazing how effective that enemy is in dealing with us, isn't it? He knows exactly what buttons to push with both of them. And Adam, in a place of perfection, where sin wasn't, chose to go against the direction of the Word of God. He took of that forbidden fruit. And we're sort of feeling the consequences even now of choices made by a man and his wife in that garden when you could not have been in a more spiritual, perfect, God-centered environment than where they lived. And yet they still refused to take that stand still driven somehow by an earthly appeal that they would not let go of. And Ananias, he was a part of the first century church. It's a church that was described as literally growing every day. The Lord was adding to the body daily those that were being saved. And it talks of their benevolent spirit and their love for their fellow man and their willingness 
to make sacrifices for the good of others. And it speaks about their commitment and conviction to be about the apostles' doctrine, to the breaking of bread, to prayers. And it speaks about the fact that they had all things common. It was a congregation of God's people that we aspire to be like. We might even have told ourselves we could never be like that. Can you imagine what that body was, what that congregation was? And Ananias is a part of it. He's a member. He's part of the family. He's a worker. And if I'm a member of that congregation and I know who Ananias is and I'm observing what his conduct is, I'm pretty impressed. And I'm encouraged and I'm boosted by what I see in him. Him and his wife made a sacrifice in the selling of their, of their property and, and the monies were brought and laid at the apostles' feet, but they were deceptive. They held back independent of each other. They both made promises and commitments of what they had done and the offering that they have brought. And if I'd have been a fellow member, I just might have gone up to them when the service was completed and said, Ananias, you sure encouraged me today. Your offering was such a blessing how many folks will be helped because of what you did? But I'd have been so wrong. You see, God and Jesus, they have a capacity that me and you don't have. They see the inside. And they know the heart. They knew the deception. And those characters, independent of each other, who came in making what appeared to be this wonderful offering of their sacrifice that was in reality filled with deception and lies, no doubt walked into an auditorium feeling pretty good about what they were doing. They were carried out dead, buried, basically outside the facility because God knew their hearts. And look, I want you to think about it. This was somebody in the Garden of Eden in a place of perfection. This is somebody that was there when the walls came tumbling down. And this was somebody who's a part of the first century church. And they wouldn't get it done. And they were lured by the appeal of this life and of this world. They made their decisions. And every one of them answered for it. And you can be sure, regardless of what our choices are, whether they be to stand for God with true convictions, or whether that be let the spirit of compromise lead me away from Him for the sake of earthly gain, we're going to answer for those choices. And we're going to answer for those decisions. Because God always knows. His Word is the standard. His Word is our guide. Nobody's actions will control mine. I'm going to answer 
and hold account for my choices. Tonight we've seen the good and we've seen the bad of that reality. In very spiritual moments and environments, we've seen people who would claim an allegiance to God falling way short because their lack of a revealed conviction. And we've talked about some heroes of the faith that were willing to stand up when seemingly nobody else would. And the common denominator for all of them is the great victories that the Lord provided when these people's actions were of great conviction and obedience to God. And by the way, just to throw this in for whatever it's worth, I believe the God that brought about great victories in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the God who brought about great victories in the days of Eleazar and Shema, is the absolute same God that can bring about great victories today. Don't you think? May God bless us in the effort. May God bless us with our choices. May God bless me with my choices. Have you made that priority of obedience to God and His plan of salvation? To hear the Word of God, believe what you've heard, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as God's Son, and be baptized. Become a part of the member of the body of Christ. To have your sins washed away. Is that a choice? for you to make tonight. It's a grown person, mature, adult, from now on decision. Are you ready to make that one tonight? Are you ready to heed the words of Jesus when He challenged all of us as members of the body of Christ to be faithful unto death and so receive the promised crown of life. God bless our choices. God bless our decisions. Not going to be easy. Going to be tough. Supposed to be. Things that are worthwhile usually are. It's all I've got. All I am. Every day. The very best I have for him. May God bless the choices we make.